my talk really um, was given by David Parkham because all the things he has said is what I'm going to say to you so I'll take a lot less time to say them the, uh, the discussion topic is um, umpire and coaches uh, relations or relationship there isn't, it's been broken down in two. I'm supposed to talk about the laws and interpretation of the game. Well, that's the last thing we'll talk about, and you'll probably ask a few questions about that. That's very easily fixed, that one. The more important one is your role with the umpires. And again, I can only say that it's all been said to you because the first notes I picked up has asked you people, why did you take it on? Now, I don't know why you took it on. And I'm not really interested why you took it on. But you've taken it on, so you've got a responsibility. And your responsibility is several fold, and particularly those of you coaches who are co coaching the kids. There you are. You've got such a great responsibility there, gentlemen. You're moulding kids' lives. Probably they get no discipline at home, those kids. Think about your own damn kids. And how are you handling them? You know, we don't get trained to be a parent. We get trained in every other aspect. Every other job that we take on, we get trained for. But we don't get trained to be a parent. And one of the difficulties I see, even with football and footballers, is there a lack of discipline. So you as a coach, particularly with the young kids, you've got to put some discipline into them. If you're a school teacher, you're supposed to put some discipline in there because we as parents, we're leaving it all up to other people. And David's right. The most important person in his kid's life at the moment is the football coach. So you've got a hell of a responsibility, haven't you? And part of that responsibility is teaching them to accept discipline and teaching them to accept the role of the umpire. Now, OK, I'm talking today on the role of the football umpire. But, gentlemen, I'd like you to put your minds out a bit and get outside the norm and start to think a little more creatively. I'm actually asking you to think of your responsibility in relationship to those kids that you and who should be looking up to you in respect to all the umpires that they're going to meet in life. Because it's more than just the football umpire, isn't it? You know, there is the, the policeman. Unless people like you start to teach them to accept discipline and to play by the laws and to respect people who are in authority, then Christ, we're going to have all sorts of troubles. Now, I have never nominated a player to any umpire. Never. Doesn't matter stuff what you've read or what you've heard, I don't ever deviate from that. And Peter Cameron could tell you, and he wasn't brought along to keep nodding in that direction, but he knows I wouldn't fall for it because I find in this area of football, and haven't we highlight, highlighted this week, hasn't it been great? Right at the very top, there's Dr. Allen and Jack himself upset about leaks. Christ, it's a joke, really. And that's why I won't say it in front of the umpires. Because I'm not setting myself up to have any names leaked. No matter how it happens, and no matter how innocently it could happen. So I've never nominated any players. But I can tell you that there are certain players playing league football today who have got no self-discipline and very little team discipline and are creating problems for their teams week after week. Now, I refer to players, and again, gentlemen, I've never nominated anybody, but I say to my umpires, I want you to think about the personality players. And we put those into four categories. And because of you uh, being such a group, let me put the personalities this way. Number one group, the out-and-out out champion. Here I am prepared to nominate players. The out and out champion. Say a Peter Knight, a Jeff Southby. I'll nominate players who are not playing right at the moment. Out and out champions. 
The umpire has a responsibility for those champions to see that they are protected, to see that they're not knocked out of the game in behind play incidents. So a champion, umpires have got to be looking out to make certain that the, the champion has been protected. The next group I referred to, to the umpies, was the champion for a day type player. Now I'm talking about <coughs> the above average player who can be a match winner, <coughs> but uh, you know, he, he has his days and his off days. I have heard uh, among my football friends say that they've been able to work some of these types of players out. That they get one of their teammates to come up behind him at the start of the game and, you know, whack him behind the ear so he starts to really fire from that point on. I'm referring to that out and out champion, the fellow that really has that day out. Now, the opposition know about those sort of players. So I have said to the umpires, boys, you must remember that, that today coaches plan every move. They talk to their players about what the strengths and weaknesses of the opposition players are. So if there's a fellow who can be a champion for a day because of some sort of mental makeup that he might uh, have to have, he might have to take the first couple of marks, they're making certain the opposition coaches that there's so much pressure placed on that fellow that he can't, you know, get his game going. So I've said to them, watch for that player. Watch the sort of tactics that are being used on that player. Because he's the sort of fellow that if they keep grinding him all the time, if they keep hitting him, and particularly unfairly, he is likely to react. And I do say to the umpires that they don't have to be proud about the fact they've reported players. Not with me, they don't. I want you all to know that every time, this is my belief, that every time a player is reported, some of the responsibility for that report has got to go back on the uh, umpire's shoulders. For some reason or other, the player or players on that particular occasion lost faith in the umpires to decide to take the law into their own hands. And I'm very strong on that. But equally I'm strong on umpires who don't report reportable incidents. And you've seen that. That's at least been consistent. It's given... Uh, myself and the group that I work with at the top, which is called the Umpires Control Board, uh, credibility among our own group. So that's the second type of player. And the second group. Now the third group of personality player that we're interested in is uh, that type of player that uh, <coughs> is just coming on and making his career, maybe playing his first year or even second year. Uh, hasn't as yet learned uh, the value of self-control, uh, thinks that uh, he can do it his way, who, if he's, um, if he's handled correctly early in his career, could be changed from that path into this path where he becomes a ball player and also a, a good team player and, for that matter, somebody who realises the importance of self-discipline. Uh, and the fourth group, of course, is that group, and there's only a handful of them, who for their reasons believe that they've got the God-given right uh, to turn football into punch ball, particularly to uh, outstanding players whom they uh, feel they can't obviously beat by sheer ability and decide the easiest way to do it rather than do all the other things such as run and chase and, and try and put pressure on, they, resor they resort uh, to punches, particularly in packs or behind play. Now, I repeat, there are only a handful of those people. And I repeat to you again that not one name has ever been mentioned. And you don't have to mention them, of course you don't. And it is the umpire's responsibility to see that that player is controlled and if he does take the law into his own hands, that he's put before the proper authority. But I try to say to the umpires, I don't try, I do say to the umpires, that the real top umpires, the great umpires, the ones that lift themselves above the ordinary fellow that just runs up and down and took it on for perhaps some of the reasons that you've taken it on because you found yourself being pushed into it, 
But the ones that really want to become the outstanding umpires, that want to really give that little extra, they're the ones that are thinking and concentrating about these, uh, these ideas, these approaches, uh, their game, the planning, the preparation that should go into their, uh, their matches, and why and how they can actually get to those players and with perhaps a sense of humour or with some other encouraging remark may be able to turn that fellow that wants to continually take the law into his own hands, may be able to turn him around. And there is time to do it. Quick and all as the game is today. The number two umpire is quite often not, you know, in the umpiring sense, not there blowing the whistle. I ask him to use those opportunities. And there's all sorts of ways they can do it. And of course today they're encouraged to go in and after the match and seek out those sort of people. Find out what makes them tick. Get alongside them. Help them. Encourage them. Now, that virtually is the approach that we're using at, with umpiring. And I'm really thrilled that, that you know I was invited here today because I am not a coach. You know, I'm floundering because I don't know enough about it. Virtually last year was completely wasted so far as uh, league umpiring was concerned. The umpires didn't trust me and they had no reason to trust me. Christ, I've been their greatest critic as a commentator. So why should they trust me? And I had to earn that trust and that respect. So that was last year. But I also have always been very self-analytical. And I've learned from football coaches, and I said in a report last year, that I would approach coaching of uh, umpires this year in the same method as football coaches approach their job. And already here today, I've, I've caught on to a couple of things that are very important to me. And Peter can tell you that that's the way we do approach it today. There was a thing that uh, David had up there. He talked about training and whether it had, in the training, a relationship to the game of football on the day. Because we do so many things that virtually don't have any relationship to the actual football game. And he's eliminating those. Christ, do you know what? For 50 years or more, Christ knows how long, umpires have trained in nothing to do with football. Sure as athletes, but nothing to do with football. And we've just started. And I'm so thrilled that young Peter's here, because he's got to brain that kid. And he can understand better by hearing what David had to say, some of the things that I'm trying to do were nowhere near David. And, and it's not said uh, because uh, I don't mean I do mean this. It's um, we're not. What I've done so far is only just touched it. Like you people are so far into it. And that's what umpiring needs, Peter. And that's why we are now on the right track. And I want to relate all this back to you people and how important it is. Because I have a lot of beliefs. I believe that the trouble with umpiring is that not enough of them have played football even at your level. I'm not talking about league football. Christ, we can't expect that. But if they'd only played, say, up to a level somewhere near the under-19s or, um, say, amateur seconds or whatever, if they could play at that level, they would have so much more going for them because they would then be able to put themselves in the other bloke's shoes. And I see that as one of our problems. I see too many of our umpires who... Um, have virtually hardly played football at all. They've been at school and they didn't have that sort of ability and so they start to run the boundary and that type of thing. And virtually they've never played. At least some of them this year are getting a bit of training in it because we play corridor football, which came from uh, some of the boys being down here, uh, training with uh, David's group and with Robert Walls. And uh, also my own ideas that I wanted to bring football training into it. I wanted boys, but the greatest problem we seem to have is with tackling. You know, holding man, holding ball, 
in the back, that type of thing. It's, um, and you've got to see every incident. That's why I put that other thing about interpretation of the laws. I put it down at the bottom because who knows? Um, so you've got to see the actual incident to be able to say, yes, that's what you should have done. So what we're doing on that side is we've uh, tackled that in a practical sense. And I've got these blokes down there playing football. And some of them have got quite a bit of ability. You can tell. And it's remarkable. The fellas that have got the football ability are the blokes that get on best with the footballers. And it's so obvious, isn't it? Because they've been there. That sticks out like, you know, like Granny's tooth to me. Truly it does. Like Snowy James. Like he was so bloody good at it. I've had to say to him, for Christ's sake, Snowy, we know you can bloody balk and you can blind turn and all that. I don't want all that. I don't want you to be the champion bloody footballer. I want you to be tackled. Because they started this, you know, we only handball. We don't kick. We only handball. And, of course, there was three against three. And Snowy was putting it out there and running around there. And, you know, of course, it was late at night too and no bastard could see him. But um, <laughs> that was helping. But I said to him, Snowy, look, tackle, tackle, tackle. That's what we're after. Because our job is to keep on giving decisions. And in this little group that we do this in, we have four groups of this corridor of football, handballing, uh, three against three, one umpiring, and one of the very experienced boys, and there are four of them, as you know, Billy Della, Ian Robinson, John Sutcliffe and Kevin Smith, they are the supervising umpire. And when the decision's given, we're in a better position to be able, in a practical sense, decide whether the decision was correct because the fellow who's got the ball is an umpire, he knows whether he's foxing for a free and, you know, whether he's deliberately pushing himself in the back and, you know, just or, not, or trying to get rid of it or not trying to get rid of it. And we've been doing that and concentrating on that. Now, that's just one aspect. But I wanted you to know that training of umpires is, gee, it's revolutionised. But if Peter, who was a teacher, therefore he's trained to learn, he could see today and what's, you know, what will obviously come out from a, you know, this type of seminar today, other things that we as umpires can latch into. Like, for instance, I made them... I'll go back to David. I told you he'd given, me, he'd given my talk. He said to you, make certain that every kid brings his football along and puts his name on it so it's his football, right? Now, if you spoke to old Turk, Tommy Layoff, he'd say, now, Harry... The reason why the kids can't do any good today is because every kid's got his own football. But David says, we want them to have their own football because we want them to learn the skills. We want them to learn. Well, no umpire had ever had a football. So I made the VFL buy them one each. By Christ, they're generous, the VFL, I can tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus, Desi Tottenham could have kept all of that business. He would have made a fortune. Um, well, we got for the elite list what they call the elite list, and that's the, most, uh, that's the biggest misnomer of all time, notwithstanding that Peter's here. Um, we've got these 30 umpires who are up at the top. And by God, Father, you know, um, I want them to be the elite list. I want them to be the most elitist group of the men in white throughout the whole of Australia. And it is my responsibility to make certain they are. And I haven't got them in that area yet. And I blame myself. And it's time that you need. You need so much time. But they've all got a football now. And it is a fair dinkum one. And I got them when I first was appointed. That was back in some old November of whatever year that was, 79. And I didn't see them until 1980. And I deliberately waited to a particular night and down we went for the first night's training I'd trimmed down a bit and I'd been out in the sun and I was as tanned as some of them and um, I thought well Christ they're going to need uh, showing that you know even the old fella can do it so I, I thought I'll show them how to bounce because the white line had gone across the centre and it happens to be a pretty important aspect of umpires now to be able to bounce the ball straight so I called them all together and I said uh, get your footballs will you well, they all stood there like stuffed mummies. 
And I said, uh, well, where's the footballs? Now, three had one. And five others had them in the car. Now, they were bloody idiots, weren't they, those five? I mean, at least the other 20-odd, at least they had the brains not even, in, uh, you know, to even bring them. But the fiver went and got them out of their cars, then had to run around and try and find a pump. <laughs> so they'd had them for four months. I don't know what they thought they got the balls for, and nobody ever used them, except John Suckliffe, whom I'd been training with during the summer months trying to teach him how to bounce. I did that a pretty good job, didn't I? He now bounce, bounce them horizontal. Um, <laughs> but at least we started with the balls and bouncing. Then the next night I said, where are your whistles? And, you know, I might have been Peter because he's got a bit of go in him. He said, what the, what he probably would have said, uh, what do we need a bloody whistle for? I said, for training. Well, geez, we don't blow whistles for training. I said, we're going to change. I said, you know, when you bounce the ball of a sappy, you happen to have those two fingers through a whistle. So when you're bouncing a ball of a, you know, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday or Thursday night and you haven't got a whistle, you've spread your fingers and you're bouncing like that and you've got a greater control. But on a Saturday, they, they can't spread. So you're bouncing it like that. And so we train with whistles. And we've done a lot of other things too. And we're gradually getting them to understand there is some sort of plan and preparation into all the training. And that word that David used so often, and that you'll find, particularly at the top level of coaching, it becomes so vital, that psychological approach. That is a thing that I've been working on. And there is no shadow of doubt that where I'm falling down, mostly with my umpires, is that I don't talk to them on a Saturday morning just prior to going out for the game. And I can't talk to them just prior to them going out on the match. And I can't talk to them a quarter time, half time and a three quarter time. Now that's the biggest thing that's holding umpiring back. Because they need, like players, to be reminded. They need to be reminded. And I guarantee everyone in this room, now I've said it, you're starting to be, say to yourself, Christ, that's right, isn't it? Because you as coaches have got to remind your players, right? Now, some of you might say, but by God, Father H, they might start, you know, uh, if you did that, they might be umpiring this way in the first quarter, this way in the second quarter. That's bullshit. That would make them consistent. And as I've said to Peter and the other boys, as from about next Saturday, they're going to come in and get their appointment so I can talk to them. Because I believe that's vital in what we're trying to do to be consistent. Now, I wanted you to get that background because I wanted you to understand there's so much happening in umpiring. Now, that's going to help you eventually because what we're doing at my level and because of the title that they've given me, this highfalutin title of Director of Umpiring, it's not just for the VFL, it's for Victoria. Big job. And um, we feed these fellas out. Every week... They go out and they get the same sort of uh, fee as a player does to go into a clinic. We are doing clinics. Now, last year we did 68 clinics. This year we've already done 152 clinics. Everywhere. And you fellas are going to use these sort of fellas because they can help you. And Peter lives out in your area in any case. So he's available. And every time you use him he gets 25 bucks, don't you? Overpaid. Jesus, that's big money, isn't it? But, boys, that's what you've got to do. Because no matter what we think of umpires, you and I, we've got to live with them. Because they're going to be there next Saturday. And I just want to remind you, because I want to get back on this responsibility thing, and I want to get into enthusiasm. And I want to certainly get into respect. I just want to remind you that if the day ever comes when we can't have an umpire to umpire of a Saturday, whether it's at your level or at our level, at the seniors, we're in trouble, aren't we? We're in trouble. Now, if you blokes think you've got problems in recruiting kids to play, 
Can you imagine what problems we have got in trying to recruit umpires? We've got tremendous problems there. That's why I've thrown it back to football clubs. But the, the football clubs are too busy. Like league clubs are the worst group to go to because they are completely and totally involved in winning. And that's where all their efforts are channeled. During the summer, sure, that's, you can talk to them, but nothing happens. What we need from VFL clubs are those players who, because of some sort of an injury, which will prevent them from playing football again, but they could still run. They're the ideal person we want to get into the umpiring side. But the higher they've played, the higher level they've gone, the more hero worship they've had, the less likely they'll be able to have the intestinal fortitude or the ability to change to take the role that the umpire has. It's a pretty tough role. It is a tough role. Really, the umpire, if he's got the ability to grow, to mentally develop, he should be a, an outstanding success in the community either in, uh, as a, in commercially, uh, socially, particularly um, in that area of, um, of community activity because he's trained. He's trained to be able to develop that way. And I only hope when I leave them that I've made a lot of them think that they're not really using their own resources to the proper degree. I'm not thinking just of football. I'm thinking of bigger things. All right, now, back to this relationship between you and the umpire. I want to put it right on level terms with you all. Eyeball to eyeball, you are responsible. Now, if you're in this game just to bloody win, because you want to be a hero at your level, and the umpire's always wrong, and you're telling your kids the umpire's always wrong, then you are the wrong type. And I don't say that just as an umpire. I say that because of my love for football. That's your first big responsibility. Because you're there to teach those kids, number one, the value of sport in their lives, the value of training, the value of preparing, the value of achieving. You're there for them to achieve, not for you to achieve for them to achieve. Now that's one of your responsibilities and it's time it was put right on the line. And part of that is that you're going to have to put up with umpires and they're going to make mistakes. Now if your reaction is to the players is that that umpire's a, you know, some sort of scum, that he's low, that he's a illegitimate and all the rest of the sort of things, if you can't condition yourself, particularly at your level, to the to the umpiring at that level, which is not going to be good. They're going to make obviously more mistakes at your level than they are as they get better trained. And God knows they make enough, even in the top games. They make mistakes. And there's two of them. So they only umpire half a gra half a gra uh, you know, half the ground. But they do make mistakes. So at your level, obviously they're going to make mistakes. Now, it's how you approach the whole thing that could make the difference to some young umpire continuing his career and some young players being able to accept umpire's decisions. That's what I'm talking about, gentlemen. I'm talking about your responsibilities. And you have a, have a big one, I can tell you. Because too many officials want to come along and blame the umpire and abuse him. You've got kids out there umpiring. Kids are 14 and 15 and 16. And if we don't have them, who else do we get? I just divert for one moment. I was out recently talking to a group of um, kids from Scotch College. And because um, the master, the sports master, they thought it was important because I'm going to talk to kids who umpire in that school, they got hold of Melbourne Grammar and Xavier and a couple of others, and they all came along. And while I was uh, waiting for that group uh, from Melbourne Grammar to come, the Scotch College first 18 were training. And I decided there and then that I would try with all my influence to make certain that every first 18 player in a, in a public school or a high school 
was forced during that year of his, um, you know, say his last year, to umpire some of the inter-house games. Now, the reason for that, boys, is this. That just as I said it's important for umpires to have played the game at a certain level so they can put themselves in the player's shoes, I think it's just as important for the player, particularly at that level, because a lot of those players in public schools and uh, high schools, they're going to go on to bigger and better things. They're going to become league players. I believe it's important for them to be put in the umpire's shoes. Because if they love football, and they want to be a top footballer, why is it that in our game, the supposed professionals don't have to know anything about the laws of the game? God for the, look, a professional in tennis, or in golf, or in any other sport that you'd like to think of, he knows the rules. But for some stupid reason, our players don't have to know the rules. And I, I just can't accept that. And I believe it will be good for football and good for those kids to go back and umpire at some of the inter-house matches. And they'll find out what it's like. Because you're no damn hero. Because once you put that whistle in your, you know, on those fingers, and particularly if you put the white shirt and the white shorts on, that's the be-all and end-all. You are now in a position of authority. And it's how you conduct yourself that you're going to be judged. It doesn't matter what age you are. I had to say to my young, my young kid about this. He was uh, two years ago. Uh, he was telling me about a report that he had, and he had to go out to some place. And I wasn't all that concerned about it. I was interested in it, of course. But I said, well, it's, nothing, it's no different to any other report, son. Because I was taking for granted he was going out to the back lane in Preston somewhere for an under, you know, because he, he had all under age games, you know, under 17s and, you know, sort of your competitions, I guess, where they're underage too. But this turned out to be, they have a lovely name for it in those, uh, those old time umpires have a lovely name for this group. Um, the 45 and, oh, I can't think of the name, Fat and 45 or something. But uh, they're the old timers who still want to have a game because they still sort of love it and they love the grog afterwards. Uh, but some of them can be pretty tough. And the bloke he's reported apparently has got, you know, he's got all the various uh, tattoos all down both bloody arms and he's 40 and, uh, and, and I didn't realise this. And of course, he's <laughs> I said to him the next day, I was in Sydney the next day, so I rang him up. Once I realised it was an open age thing, and I said, well, how'd you get on? And um, he said, I didn't think I'd go my evidence too well, Dad. And I said, well, what did you say? I, I, he said, well, I went in and I just told him exactly as I saw it. They started to ask me questions. I said, yes, yes, no, no. He said, they then said, all right, we can go out. Um, they gave the decision. I said, did you shake hands with the player like I told you afterwards? He said, no, I didn't bother about that, Dad. I went straight out, ran down the lane as fast as I could, <laughs> and got in the car, and uh, a mate of his drove him. He said, he was waiting at the end of the lane, and we drove off like blazers. Well, it's a sort of a harrowing experience when you think of the kid was 16, I think he was, and he's with these open age people, and the tribunal was held in some hall at some back lane in Preston. But as I pointed out to Brad, Brad, you can't accept that. Mate, as soon as you put that umpire's uniform on, you know, you're a different person. The players look upon you differently. And it's right, because you're the authority. No one cares whether you're 15 or 17 or 35 or what. You're the authority. And of course, as we all know, don't we? How do you put experience into uh, people of 15 and 16 and 17? They're the sort of kids that are umpiring your game. So I'm asking you, please, if you love the game and you must, you wouldn't be here today. You wouldn't do the job that you're doing because you're not being paid for those jobs. You do it because you love kids and you love, uh, you love football. I want you to understand that we do need your help with those umpires. I know they're going to upset you. So I'm asking you, can you think about this talk today and just try to um, temper what you're going to do, what you're going to say, particularly to those presidents and others around the club and the bloody parents <laughs> who know that every time their kid makes a mistake, it's either your fault as the coach because you haven't got him playing in the right position or it's the umpire. <laughs> so can you think about that? Because that is a true responsibility that we've all got to share in the development of the umpire. Now on the practical side, how can I help you there? 
Look, on the interpretations of laws and that sort of thing, I'm happy to get our group of umpires at any time to come out in twos and threes and they'll be the top umpires. Not only to talk to your boys and your clubs, but more importantly, perhaps, to talk to your umpiring group. Because your group may be a separate group. I don't know where the umpires come from. Alan uh, was trying to tell me, he, he thinks that, do you have your own special group of... Eastern, Eastern District. Eastern District. Eastern District. Well, we're happy to come out and talk to them. In fact, we already would have been there. And we'll continually do that. Because that's the sort of liaison we've got to have. Because just as footballers, you know, your kids as footballers have heroes and when they see those Carlton boys come out, geez, that'd be like Christmas for them, wouldn't it? Well, the umpires, they put the Dallas and the Robinsons and the Camerons, they put them on a pedestal. And it's good for them to rub shoulders. And we give them trophies for, you know, for, uh, uh, for being the, uh, the best or the, the most improved and all that sort of thing. We've, we've in, in, incorporated all those things in the last year or so. So we do do that. Now, in respect to the interpretation of the laws, it would be far better for you to talk with Peter and, uh, you know, on a, on a particular day, uh, out there, with the boys out on the training track and showing them, demonstrating, rather than me tell you. All I could say to you there is this, that whatever the umpire is doing, hopefully, in the first quarter, one would like to think he might have been doing it the same way in the last quarter. And therefore, it is up to the coach to interpret and to be able to instruct these players what's happening. The overall thing I'd like to believe that is happening is that if you're first in for the ball, you're going to get the best go. Now, that's how the instructions are at the top. And believe it or not, even Peter now tells me today that he thinks he's got it right. Um, because he's going to be a top umpire, that fellow. But for every now and again, he's so bloody sudden death on a bloke who's battled his guts out to get the ball. He's no sooner got it and Christ, he blows the whistle and, well, don't you like it? He goes. <laughs> In his case, he can get away with it because he can fight. <laughs> but some of those other blokes, you know, oh, God. Peter will tell you that no umpire's allowed to stand behind me when I'm giving a talk. And they often wondered why. The cry. Um... <laughs> But I think that, um, I think that does indicate uh, something about holding the ball or whatever. Yeah, I think that's what that does indicate. But we do encourage, uh, gentlemen, that, and I'm hoping that I'm starting at the top, because as I say to those, those umpires, those VFL umpires, by God, you talk about responsibility. I've let them know where their responsibilities are. Because those VFL matches are now setting the standard in play, in technique, in, uh, in, in every fashion of, and every aspect of our football, what we do at the VFL is now controlling football, our game, right throughout the length and breadth of Australia. How the umpires interpret, how they perform, that's being copied by every umpire. How the, the VFL players, whatever they do, if they dive on the ball, like they are at the moment and we're trying to stop them, once they start diving, they're diving up in Togemore. They'll be diving in Townsville. They'll be diving down there in, uh, you know, Hobart or somewhere other place, Bell Reeve or wherever, because they see it and they emulate. Your kids, you know, the level of skill at your kids in comparison, you know, to years ago, your kids can do things today that I guarantee that we as kids couldn't do because they keep watching, don't they? And they keep learning because they watch these things and they see what they're doing. Like the, the, just think about the impact that um, the world of sport, you know, with their handball and all that sort of thing. And Sheedy, who really, you know, kept on talking about handball so much. Both hands. Like kids do it today, don't they? They really, the keen kids, they do it. And they've got a football and they should have a football so they can keep practising it. And this is why our boys, their job is so, so important. And I'm hoping that one day it'll it will infiltrate down so that all the umpires at least have got the, the basics the same. And the number one of all those basics is that if you're first in for the ball, the umpire's got to give you every opportunity. And the way I say it to my top blokes is if you're going to err, err on the side of the player who's boring for the ball.